taken from the 10th chapter of the Gospel according to St. John. Now about that time, they were celebrating the Feast of Dedication in Jerusalem. Today we know it as Hanukkah. And it was winter and Jesus was strolling through the temple under the portico of Solomon. And the Jews gathered around him and they said, don't keep us in suspense. If you are the Messiah, tell us straight. And Jesus said, I have told you, but you don't believe. The works that I do in my Father's name bear witness to who I am, but you don't believe because you are not of my sheep. My sheep recognize my voice, I lead them, and they follow me, and I give them eternal life, and not a one of them will perish because no one can snatch them out of my hand. What my Father has given to me is greater than anything else, and no one can snatch it from the Father's hand, because the Father and I are one. Word of God, word of life. Please be seated. When I was a small boy, my image of God was of an old man with a gray beard and a long white robe sitting in a rocking chair someplace. Um, kind of like Gandalf from Lord of the Rings, maybe, or Dumbledore, Harry Potter, okay, or even Michelangelo's depiction of God, the creation of Adam in the Sistine Chapel. And that image stayed pretty consistent all through my growing up. And it wasn't until I got into college and then really into seminary that my image of God began to change. And it did because I was studying the Bible seriously for the first time in my life. And one of the key moments in shifting my image of God was when I started to study that first creation story in Genesis chapter 1. And near the end of that story, we read this. And God said, let us make humankind in our image after our own likeness. So God created humankind in God's image after the image of God. God created them. Male and female, God created them. And the first thing that struck me as I studied this is that it takes both male and female to fully reflect the image of God. Men alone don't fully reflect the image of God, and women alone don't fully reflect the image of God. It takes both male and female to fully reflect God's image. And then the second thing that I noticed is that um, God created sexuality, that you and I, we are male and female, we're defined by that, but God is not. God is not male. God is not female. God is beyond both. God is pure spirit. God is different than us in that way. And so we can't say that God is male and we can't say God is female. God is beyond sexuality. And in that way, if you ever studied the ancient uh, Roman and Greek gods, very different from that, right? All those gods were male or female. Zeus, Apollo, Venus, Aphrodite, etc. God of the Bible is very different than that. And so I came to realize that God is not a guy and that my childhood image of God would have to go and I'd have to find something better. And so I continued my studies and the next thing that happened is I began to learn about a word in the New Testament, a little word, the word Abba. Now, when I say Abba, I'm not talking about these guys. It's not the Swedish pop band from the 70s. They are not in the Bible. You don't have to look. I can promise you that. Okay? Instead, in the Bible, Abba is an Aramaic word that means father or even daddy. 
Jesus' native language, his mother tongue, what Mary and Joseph taught him, was Aramaic. And thus he very likely used this word whenever he prayed to his God and Father. And the interesting thing about that word is it's very intimate, it's very familiar. And so for Jesus, coming to his God and Father in prayer was like a child speaking to a loving parent that the reason that that word was used is because Jesus had this intimate relationship with God, with his Father, with the first person of the Holy Trinity. And so we find him using that word in the Gospels. And one of the most uh, telling moments was when he was in the Garden of Gethsemane. Remember, he was wrestling in prayer struggling with what awaited him, the barbaric execution the next day. And he said, Abba, Father, for you all things are possible. Remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not what I want, but what you want. And so when he was praying most fervently, he began with that word, Abba. Well, St. Paul then takes that, and in his letters he uses that word twice. Romans 8, he says, when we cry, Abba, Father, it is God's very spirit bearing witness with our spirit that we are God's children. And then in Galatians, and because you are children, God has sent sent the spirit of his son into our hearts crying, Abba, Father. So you are are no longer a slave, but a child. Every time that word appears, It is to reassure us that we are God's beloved children and that God is like a loving parent who invites us to come for comfort, for strength, for wisdom, for all that we need for everyday life. God as a loving parent. Dads are loving parents. And so we can imagine God as a dad, but moms are also loving parents. And so we can imagine God as a mother. I think that we find that uh, again and again uh, throughout the scriptures. And as I came across that idea for the first time that I could imagine God as a loving mother, it made perfect sense to me because like I told the kids up here, My mom has been the most loving person in my life. She's the reason I never doubted God loved me. My struggle was believing that God existed, and so all through my teenage years, I lost my faith. But even then, when I was a teenager, I thought, well, if God did exist, though, God would still love me because of my mom. Her love was just so constant and so real. And so um, I began to work through the scriptures and I found some interesting things. Jesus pictured God as a woman who lost a coin and she lights a lamp and sweeps all through the house until she finds that coin. And then in another place, when he was lamenting over Jerusalem, he said he was like a mother hen wanting to gather her brood under her wings. And so I began to see that there are ways in which we can image God that reflect the loving God as a parent, God as a mother. But it didn't stop there. I realized that when we pray the Lord's Prayer, we're really praying our Abba, our Daddy, our Father, And so I found these paraphrases of the Lord's Prayer that try and make explicit what's implicit in that word. Here's one, eternal spirit, earth maker, pain bearer, life giver, source of all that is and that shall be, father and mother of us all, loving God in whom is heaven. And then this one, heavenly father, heavenly mother, Holy and blessed is your true name. And then I started looking through poems and hymns and so forth, and here's just one, one of my favorites. 
It's the hymn, Loving Spirit, like a mother you enfold me, hold my life within your own, feed me with your very body, form me of your flesh and bone. God as a loving mother, I think that that's an image that we can use again and again to come to a deeper understanding of who God is. And in fact, I would say that the more images we have for God, the better. And I would invite you to expand the images that you have for God. And there are images throughout the scriptures that you can use in your own prayer life. I think it's important that we do this for a couple of reasons. One is that because of the um, predominance of male language in the scriptures, God is Father, when that's the only thing we use, what happens is this. This is called the great chain of being. If you know anything about philosophy in the Middle Ages, you know that the Middle Ages, the theologians in the Middle Ages had this great vertical chain of being. It started with God, then the angels, kings, queens, dukes, duchesses, etc., 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 all the way down, animals, etc. And every time, in every category, it was male and female. Women were less. Women were thought to be inferior. And we are still dealing with the effects of that great chain of being mindset today because women do get treated as second-class citizens in the church and in the culture more often than I would like to believe. And so we need a way to undermine the great chain of being and to see that the ground is level at the foot of the cross that we are all equal before God. And I think the other reason for expanding your images for God is because there is no one single image that adequately captures who God is. They all help in their own way, but none fully does that. God is a mystery, and so we need all kinds of images and narratives and metaphors to understand God in a deeper way. We find that Jesus did this all the time. Um, in the Gospel of John, remember those great lines where he said, I'm the light of the world. I'm the bread of life. I am the resurrection and the life. And then he imaged God as the woman who was sweeping, as the father who welcomed back his wayward son, as the good Samaritan who helped the man who'd fallen among the thieves. And then if you pray the Psalms, think of all the images for God in the Psalms. God is a rock. God is a refuge. God is a shelter. God is a potter. God is like a lamb. And so expanding our images for God is one way of living more deeply into the reality of God's love. The best and first image for God is, of course, Jesus. Paul tells us this in Galatians. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. And the reason that Jesus is the icon, the image of God, is not that he's male. It's because he's loving. He is the incarnation of God's love. He is God's love in human flesh and blood and bone. And so Jesus is the central image for what God is like. You want to know what God is like? Simple answer, Jesus. And around that, we have all these other images like constellations around this central image all of which help us to live more deeply into the mystery of God. Julian of Norwich was a mystic and a nun back in the 1300s in England. And she wrote, just as God is our father, so God is also our mother. 
this idea, this image of God as a mother, that God's love is a maternal love, has been with us for a very long time. And so, wherever you are in your spiritual journey, no matter how many images you have for God and no matter how many you use, I encourage you, invite you, plead with you to expand your repertoire of images for God. Seek to find more and more. And if you've never imagined God as a mother, I can't think of a better day than today, Mother's Day, to imagine God as a mother. Because our God is a mothering God, and we are her beloved children.